So when we're inside the property, uh, we will use a damp meter. We'll have a general scope around with it, and that should ask more questions than it gives answers. Uh, we'll do another video another day on actual use of a damp meter. But we use the agent's details again, and here we're taking just general relative readings measured between zero and a thousand or zero and nine and nine around the property. And in this back room, we can see we've got some, some issues. That there says photo because sometimes we'll take a photo of an issue and we'll write all our, our damp meter readings on it. So in here, we've got a couple of problems. The first is on this wall, the, on this chimney stack. Um, we've got quite a bit of blistering and bubbling here and we've got high damp meter readings all the way around this area in general. Someone stuck a pin probe in there. Um, why, I don't know, because it's quite obvious that there's a, there's a bit of a damp problem. Upstairs, the chimney stacks, uh, sorry, I say upstairs, outside the chimney stacks aren't capped. Uh, they're not ventilated inside, so very likely you've got an issue both with penetrating damp, storm water coming down the stack, and condensation buildup because there's no natural ventilation to it. In this same room, on the rear wall, we've got some damp staining. And in the bedroom upstairs, there's also some issues. Um, this is why on our photos, we've got uh, a whole array, whole array of, of damp meter readings we've taken. Now, this seems to be to us that we've got rainwater from the main roof discharging onto the uh, rear addition roof with a, a small shoe, which is a common arrangement in buildings like this. But because the soil stack's then tucked in that corner, there's a, a quirky weathering detail around the back of the soil stack. And my thoughts are that we've got overspill from that guttering during times of heavy rainfall. It's all come down through one rainwater pipe, which is causing this wall to be uh, slightly damp. It's not a major issue. It's actually quite easy to sort out. And with the age of the property and the level of decor pre-decorated inside is, uh, is not going to be an issue either. So there's more to dampness than just uh, damp proof courses. So other issues we're looking at is ventilation. Now if we have a quick look in the kitchen. <clears throat> There's no mechanical extraction in here at all. There's no mechanical extraction upstairs in the bathroom either. So the kitchen, the bathroom, the two main moisture producing rooms of the property. What these rooms will do is well, they'll produce moisture when you're uh, using a hot tap, when you're using uh, the stove, stuff like that. And the warmer air gets, generally the more moisture it can hold. So you want to be able to take that moisture out of the building at source. At the moment, that moisture's been allowed to migrate throughout the rest of the property, which can cause further issues elsewhere. Um, while we're on the subject of ventilation, as part of our survey, we'd look at the roof ventilation. There isn't any. Um, our roof should be adequately ventilated. On a windy day, you really want to stand in a roof space and feel the breeze coming through. If we have a nice, good level of ventilation over a good level of insulation, we are going to reduce chances of condensation. We're going to create an environment that beetles and bugs and all those nasties don't like, and you won't get any rot issues either. If we conversely create a, a loft space that isn't ventilated, it has a wrong kind of insulation, particularly foam between the rafters, um, then we're creating a warm, moist environment. Beetles like that, rot likes that, timber decay likes that, so that is an environment we do not want to create. Likewise, underneath our feet, um, we have a suspended timber floor in this house. We've got air bricks at the front of the property, we've got air bricks at the back of the property, and that creates a nice subfloor, a subfloor flow of ventilation which reduces chances of, of rot, beetle infestation and decay. So the next part of our inspection is the roof space. And in this property, the loft access hatch is located in the rear addition roof space. Unfortunately, this means a very tight squeeze through to the, the main roof, but it's something that, that needs to be done because we need to get in there to inspect and, and see if there's any issues. Um, but while we're on the ladder looking in the rear roof space, We'll see if there's any particular issues we need to be aware of. And in here we've also got the cold water storage tank, but we'll look at that in a moment. So let's try and squeeze through that gap into the main roof space. Okay, so I'll just squeeze through the smallest gap to possibly get through. Not the day to be wearing a, a beige jumper. Um, hands and knees, can't see where any of the ceiling joists are, but I'm into the main roof space now. Why anyone puts a loft access hatch in such an inaccessible location is beyond me. <clears throat> if I start coughing, I'll apologise. But you can see the amount of crap floating around in the air in here. I really should have a mask on, but I don't. So what we're looking at in the roof space is the main roof structure. So this is a cut and pitch roof, standard size timbers, 
uh, roughly four by twos with a four by three purlin and this is braced so these are the rafters four by twos four by three purlin braced down to the center load bearing wall with a four by two strut, uh, strut what we'd also like to see from the rear purlin across to the front purlin is a series of collars but there isn't any uh, this is not ideal um, it can assist with roof spread if there's no suitable cross cross tie um, eventually at some point the um, nail fixings down at low level there and on the rear slope down at low level over there will fail or start to corrode and um, you can get lateral spread in the roof occurring uh, the collar cross ties the purpose of those is to uh, is to stop that the um, structure seems okay with four by two rafters we're looking at a general measurement of around 2.4 meters on maximum span of the rafters so so all is good within that degree while we're up here we'll look at the roof underlay so here's what we call a sarking felt and we can see our laps have been formed the correct way around uh, it's not the first time if they weren't um, but it's not something you come across all too often over the floor joist we've got about six inches of insulation and then there's a further four inches or so between them. So we're, we're looking at about two, 250 of insulation up here, which is, uh, which is very good for such an old property. Um, but the roof does need to be ventilated. Uh, there's no suitable ventilation up here at the moment. And actually feels a little bit muggy given the fact it's uh, only early April. <clears throat> so it'll certainly be our suggestion that cross ventilation is provided to the roof. Okay, so we've looked at the external structure of the building, we looked at the roof, the walls, uh, the roof structure, and now we're going to come down through the building or we'll start actually on the ground floor and then we'll go back up to the first floor where we're going to look at the floors next. Now there is ventilation front to rear of the property, but that is broken and that could potentially cause an issue and I'll come back to that in a minute. So ground floor, traditional in, in terrace houses like this, uh, suspended timber floor, the floor joists will bear on the front outside wall, then there'll be a honeycomb wall running roughly down the middle of each room, depending on the size of the room. And then again on this separates the uh, front and rear room in the, in the main section of a, of a terrace house. This is the main centre load bearing wall. And then there'll be a honeycomb wall mid span again and then onto a rear wall. <clears throat> and we'd expect our floor joists to be about four by two or so. So what we're looking for, are there any issues with the floor that we need to report? This floor is finished with what we call a finger parquet. Um, but as a surveyor, we do a heel test. So we go up on, our, on the balls of our feet and slam down. And that feels nice and sound, but I am near the corner. We then do that to the center of the room, right above the um, honeycomb wall, not so bad. But perhaps if we get somewhere else, still wobbling there. Now here, that floor is spongy. So there's an issue with the floor just here that we need to report on. And in fact, we had some uh, moderate damp readings here. So uh, that could be indicative that there's um, an issue in the floor that we need to report on. So we'd advise our client of that, but they should be allowing for some repairs to be done to the floor structure here. Okay, if you follow me through. <clears throat> we're on the, uh, this is still on the ground floor. Now that was a clearly suspended timber floor. Once we get into the kitchen, it's concrete. So I've got a big concrete slab in the middle of the house again, under the kitchen, which we do find from time to time. So we've got suspended timber, which is ventilated at the front of the property and to the rear under the dining room window. And then we've got a slab of concrete in the middle, and then we're back into a suspended timber floor in the rear of the property, which again in here actually feels, feels quite sound. And we've been around the edge and that wasn't, that was okay. Got two air bricks there and one on the back. So there is some ventilation, but it's over that side of the room. So then, is there any issues over here? And we're, we're, we're quite satisfied that, that there's not. So that's the ground floor. Now we'll have a look upstairs. Okay, so on the ground floor, we've got our honeycomb sleeper walls that are the mid center of each span roughly, um, and they help to break up the floor joist span. First of all, we can't have that, otherwise you'd have a wall in the middle of each room which wouldn't work. So we get an idea here roughly as to the depth of the floor joist. So we've got our, our, our perimeter beaded trim around there, our floor joist up to about there, and a ball nose detail handrail uh, spindles behind here. So we're looking at about 200 millimetres for the floor thickness. So if we actually go upstairs, 
I'll go into the front row, watch the tools. So here our span is three and a half meters or so. For a suspended timber floor and a property this old, that's pretty good going. Yeah, quite happy with that. That gives us an indication that the floor is reasonably sound, the floor joists aren't overspanned, and there's no significant issues going on with them. I'll just try that in the back room as well. If that was a major issue, we'll be chatter proper chattering on doors and stuff like that. I have done that before on forward glasses and when I fall out of cabinets. I should imagine every other surveyor in the world has done the same at some point. Okay, so that's, that's a, a brief inspection of the floors. As I said earlier, that wall that separates the living room and the dining room downstairs, front bedroom, back bedroom, upstairs, is the main centre load bearing wall to the house. And we would expect our floor joists to span front to back um, onto that wall. Now, with fitted carpets throughout, it's a bit difficult to get that confirmed. Sometimes in the airing cupboard, there would be um, no fitted carpet, but in this area and cupboard, they've got a, a raised bulkhead on the floor, so we can't even detect that there. So, highly unlikely that floor joists will go side to side. Um, highly likely they bear on that, that wall because that's the way millions of, uh, or at least hundreds of thousands of mid terrace houses were built. Okay, on to the next bit. <clears throat> okay, next element of our inspection is to look at the, uh, the walls and the ceilings. And again, we're looking at, we're trying to look as best as we can as a structure to see if there's any structural issues we need to report. Um, and then less so on the finishes. I, I, I'm not a surveyor who really goes into much on the finishes of the property because that's what people see when they walk around the property. Um, but I'm, con I'm concerned what perhaps you can't see. So here we've got um, a scratch coat of Artex on the ceiling. It's possible that Artex might contain asbestos. Uh, so that would be a warning to our client. Um, some asbestos material, just by, I'll digress for a moment, just explain a bit about asbestos. Some asbestos materials are homogenous, so they were factory made, things like asbestos cement, uh, certain kinds of AIB, um, asbestos insulating board, um, that is factory made and it has a reasonably consistent number of fibres per square metre. Um, when our text was started to be used and have asbestos fibres in it, it was thrown in by hand as a, as a binder to the mix. Um, so you could find that there's high asbestos there and none there. So most people, if they're doing an asbestos test on an Artex ceiling, they'll, they'll test from multiple points. Uh, this is what's called lard and plaster. So uh, ceiling joists span front to rear with a beam going over the bay window and onto, again, our centre load bearing wall. Uh, and then our chestnut lard or hazel lard will, will, will span the other way and it'll have a lard and plaster, uh, sorry, like a plaster, a lime plaster um, ceiling finish above that blow that even. So as they apply the plaster to the underside of the lard, it curls over, uh, forms things called keys and it sets. Um, and that will last for 80 to 100 years or so. So some ceilings will last longer, but some will just collapse completely out of the blue as the, um, as the keys gradually fail. So this has got an Artex finish on it. Out here in the landing, it's got um, a wallpaper finish. Um, it's just a embossed wallpaper uh, used on the ceiling and the walls. Um, nothing really to report here. Again, it's steel, lard and plaster structure. Um, I've mentioned probably about five times now that our main internal load bearing wall is the one that splits the front two rooms on ground and first. And that leaves this main wall inside. Most terrace properties will have this. It's stud work. Now, although it's stud work, people say it's not load bearing. It is to a degree. This one, not so much, but the one downstairs that separates the, living, uh, the rear dining room and the kitchen, uh, will support the loading of this wall so there is some low, low bearing factor to it but our floor joists span the other way sometimes this will even be built off the floorboards but we would assume err on the side of caution and assume that the wall that directly below this downstairs separating the dining room and the landing and the hall sorry is low bearing because it supports this as well um, one final note actually i'm just going to show you this uh, low bearing wall again this one particularly that's actually masonry I think there's some blown areas of plaster um, but this wall sometimes will be uh, stub work and because it's stub work people say oh it's not load bearing it can be stub work load bearing and non-load bearing it can be masonry load bearing and non-load bearing the only way to determine if it's load bearing or not is to look at the loadings being imposed upon it if there are any and how they're being distributed down through the property so if this is a non-load bearing stud which we know it's not they'll just have um, stub work in it 
if there was load bearing and stud work, then there'll be big diagonal braces cut into the wall to help distribute the load down. Okay, so as we get towards the end of the internal elements of the inspection, before we start on sanitary wear and services, we're looking at joinery. Uh, joinery will include the stairs, the architraves, the skirtings, the doors, um, and the kitchen. Now this old property, very basic kitchen, we've got some, a pair of very basic wall units, a worktop, and a little drawer unit there, and a base unit under the kitchen. Serviceable? Not really. It's, it's way past its, its age, and if anyone's living in here, they're going to want to pop a new kitchen in fairly early on. Um, we'll walk through the ground floor of the house. Architraves around the door lining. So this is a door lining. Uh, these architraves are of uh, an old kind of OG pattern. Um, and then as we're into the hall, we've got these, these beaded skirtings that are almost a bit touristy because we've got the mould that then starts to come up a little bit. Uh, so it's halfway between a, a torus and a, and a beaded skirting, um, about 200 high, nice old timbers, good to keep. You can get these reprofiled. Re, re um, what will happen is if you need to do any alterations to skirtings like this, um, get a stripper on that, get it all stripped back, and then someone will come out and they can make a profile up to match that, and then get either a metre or 500 metres run out exactly the same. Uh, this is the stairs, I'll come back to stairs in a minute, but underneath the stairs we've got a spandrel cupboard. Very basic ledged, uh, ledged uh, panel um, uh, TNG door. And then we can look into the underside of the stairs. So let me just reach in and grab a torch. Okay, so under the stairs we're looking for the general condition of the structure of the stairs and if there's any woodworm. There has been a couple of large braces installed on this stairs. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, because on this side we have our string, which is reasonably sound, and on that side you're not going to be able to see it, I think, but we have the string to the stairs. Now between the string, when the staircase is manufactured, uh, we have routed uh, grooves that are cut into the string both sides, and then our risers and our treads are fitted in there, wedges there are fitted, driven in and glued, and it braces the whole thing together. These chocks are then popped in as well, sometimes pin nailed, just to provide a bit of extra support. This additional bracing doesn't look new, and if it was any real structural support, the, the joists would be, so the timbers would be the other way around. Um, but all in all, we've been up and down the stairs probably a dozen times now, and it seems reasonably sound condition. So I'll just go up front and have a look at the stairs. <clears throat> so we'll start with a bit of staircase terminology. It's a new post with a new post cap, quite a big size. This is a, uh, a, a rounded uh, bottom bottom tread but these are the treads and these are the risers together they give the going of the stairs now what we're looking at in the domestic stairs is that should be not be more than 42 degrees with with current building regulations but it's an old house it's going to vary so it's not, not particularly critical got a handrail underneath there is all boarded out but there'll be our spindles so just a bit of hardboard or, or thin ply that's been fitted to the side of the stairs but these are sound, there's no creaking or movement, all in, all in good order really. Bit of a shame someone's actually trimmed that off. Very poorly damaged, like I've got a chisel in and whacked it uh, to cut that off. I should imagine because our, our stair lift is there. Okay, so moving on. These are replacement doors to the property. This is a four panelled, this is a raised panel door, four panel Victorian style. If we've got the two at the top then it becomes a Georgian style. So with the doors, what we're looking for, does it open and close? Yep, all quite well. If, uh, if you come in, Charlie, I'll just show something where you can detect old buildings have had a bit of movement. Uh, you can sometimes see the door if it's been cut out of alignment or not. That is uh, a bit of taper on that, um, which would just say that that side's dropped down or it's just poorly fitted. A bit underside on that because the building as a whole isn't showing any signs of, signs of movement. So as a door, we've got Style, style, top rail, centre rail, bottom rail, mountain or million, uh, and then our four raised panels. On uh, doors of this age, that probably had some kind of uh, tongue on there, so it'd be mortised and tenon into that. Unfortunately, someone then comes along and cuts a uh, door up and handle right in the way. Ideally, that should always be above where the tenon or that mortise and tenon is. Um, but other than that, it's uh, it's a fairly basic internal door and in reasonable condition. <clears throat> Out here in the hall, uh, someone's put in a decorative um, 
dado rail. Pretty poorly done, if I must say. We've got screw fixings exposed. Um, hasn't been, I might have been glued actually. And then here we've got a very poor bit of, uh, bit of detailing just here where they cut that. And around here, they tried to go around a corner with it. We've got a cut there, a poor cut there. So it's, someone's tried to add a bit of detail, but a bit of a poorly done afterthought in my view. Okay. okay, so now we're going to look at sanitary wear. So we're in the bathroom. The bathroom just has a vanity basin with a uh, bath and an over bath shower. Uh, we've got a mixer tap there. And what we're looking for is, are there any issues with the sealants? And there is there, look, we've got a bit of a gap in the sealants to the back of the bath. So uh, maybe not so much of an issue because we're quite some distance away from the shower and the shower curtain. But if that was up that end of the bath, then that would certainly be uh, certainly be an issue. So we've got our basin here and then we're going to look at our wastes. So uh, the waste assembly is there. This is our trap. That should be at least 75 millimetres from, from there to there uh, to stop any siphoning of the trap. And then we've got our hot and cold feet, one of which looks a bit manky, but there's no signs of a leak. That all looks in, uh, in reasonable condition. Uh, hot water in this property is actually provided by a multi-point heater. So we'll come on to that when we're doing our heating section. And we've got our toilet. So uh, not particularly nice, but with toilets, we're looking back around the waist. Is there any drips? Is there any signs of a leak? Got an isolation valve there. And again, not, not in great order. It's all a bit dated, but doesn't seem too bad. So at the rear of the house, we've got our waste pipe there, 40 millimeter waste for the bath with an access um, T on it. And then we've got our 32 millimeter waste for the wash hand basin, um, bit wonky. Um, probably needs to be replaced actually, there's evidence of a bit of a split up there as well. This discharges into a 75 millimeter uh, vertical waste pipe, which in turn discharges into a low level gully. There is a gap between the bottom of the pipe and the top of the uh, gully grating. So although it's ventilated, it doesn't need to be. And there we go, picks up our, our kitchen waste as well. The uh, soil stack is WC connector, again with an access cap on it. Ventilates at high level and then discharges into ground below, below ground level just there. Unfortunately, there's no below ground access i.e. manholes or inspection chambers in the property, so we can't inspect and comment on any drainage. Okay, on to services, and we'll start off with gas. Um, what we have is our, what we thought initially was our incoming gas meter uh, supply, but that's been capped off, and the gas meter is now located to the front of the property. The uh, heat into the building is via these fires, and each one has its own gas supply. And there's also gas to the upstairs boiler. Uh, water heater, sorry, and to the cooker. So um, the gas, there's no, no evidence of any leaks or anything like that, but it is all a bit dated. And with the amount of work that's required to the property generally, we would suggest that a, uh, a test is done on the, uh, on the gas. Now with the electrics, we've got a, uh, our incoming main is located in the cupboard under the stairs, just here. So this is our, this is our service head from the 60 amp fuse. Uh, single phase like you'll get in most properties. If this was free phase, we'd have three of these fuses all going up to different distribution boards and a digital meter. So it's a prepayment type. No, it's just a, just a digital meter. So then we've got our meter tails that come from the meter into our consumer unit. This is a Wirelex, it's a plastic distribution board. Uh, so it's a basic on off um, with five miniature circuit breakers. Uh, so number one is blank. Um, and our five lives are labelled as upstairs sockets, downstairs sockets, that one's unlabeled, downstairs lights and upstairs lights. So that one may be a uh, cooker or boiler or something like that. Very basic, very dated. There's no installation details or anything like that. Um, although these are MCBs, miniature circuit breakers, what we would often look for, if these were a rewirable fuse, there's often giveaways like pliers fuses and sometimes fuse wire next to the distribution board which indicates that there's always been or there's ongoing issues that people constantly keep that stuff to hand so they can um, quickly do a repair. Now the cabling, sorry Charlie I was going to come out change the mind, cabling's all very dated probably looking at the cables I'd say late 70s early 80s 
um, it did change to grey sometime, uh, mid to late 90s I think, and then uh, sometimes it's gone back to, uh, to white as well now. So we've got some switches and sockets, um, a little area of non-compliance here, it's not a major thing I don't think because of um, how much repairs are needed, but from the edge of the cooker to that should be 300 millimeters. If it's not, it's, it's a lot further than that. Uh, it's not closer than that. Um, we don't have many switches and sockets scattered about the house. Um, there are some, of course, but not not as many as some would expect these days. So, in a living room, we've got a double there and a double down there, and that's it for the whole of the living room. So, not not a great amount. Um, lighting wise, it's all fairly basic. Uh, pendant in each room. Uh, with a switch so we would recommend on a property of this age get an IC test done if you're going to keep it as it is if you're thinking of rewiring and doing substantial works then that's probably a waste of money just, just get it rewired anyway okay so next item then we're going to look at uh, uh, our hot and cold water now I'm just going to pop in a bit here but we recorded up in the roof space about the cold water so that's here for this property, the cold water storage tank is located in the roof to the rear addition. This is a plastic circular tank. It's got a lid fitted, but there's no insulation to the lid and it's got a tie on jacket. So it's better than some we see, but there is room for improvement. The pipe work is insulated in parts, not in others. So again, getting up here with a bit of uh, insulation one weekend, some pipe lagging and some tape is, uh, Potentially a day well spent, um, not particularly much fun, but what we're trying to do is avoid details like this and like this, which is where failure can occur. And when failure occurs, if that happens while you're away for two weeks skiing and you get back to a house that's completely flooded out, then uh, even on a three bed mid terrace like this, you could very easily be looking at the thick end of 70, 80, 90,000 pounds worth of damage. And back to hot water now. So hot water, it took us a while to find the hot water cylinder for this property because there isn't one. <clears throat> but what we've actually got is we've got a direct multi point uh, boiler located in the back bedroom. So this does, this is an instantaneous water heater, so it does uh, hot water on demand. So you turn the hot tap on, it heats the water up. So you have cold water in, hot water out, and gas in, and, and it's, it's that simple. Is that suitable these days? Not really. You know, you probably wouldn't want a family working with that. And when we consider the, the heating that we'll look at in a minute, um, probably time for a new boiler that you could have a uh, pressurised system, so pressurised hot water, all the cold directly off the mains, um, and a lot more stored hot water, which would be ideal for a, a family. And this is a family house, it's three bedrooms. Okay, so finally then on the services, we'll look at the heating. <laughs> now heating to each of the rooms has got one of these old gas fires. Um, I don't know when these were, were installed, but it's not recent, that's for sure. Uh, controls are going to be room by room. It's basic on off. There's no controllability for the whole house. There's no central thermostat. There's no central programmer. Um, and these are things are, are, are fairly inefficient. It would explain why all the flues are open outside, because we can't be capping off anything if we've got a gas fire using the flues. Um, but maybe as part of the overall renovation for the house, we would look to get rid of these. I don't know if that's your thing or not. Personally, I think they, they don't look too good, but it looks on everything and but it's just not my cup of tea. But we could have a nice fireplace here, uh, more akin to the property, which would be a decorative cast iron surround. Uh, you could have a log grate in there, in there, in there. It doesn't mean you have to use it, it could still be ventilated and capped off. But this would all have been installed in the 50s and this is probably maybe as late as the 90s or so, but not an efficient way of heating a property. A good central heating system would be much better for a property of this this age and type. The only thing I think we haven't mentioned so far is the cold water. I know I mentioned in the roof space, but we've got a stopcock outside the property, and we've got a cold water stopcock in the middle of the kitchen. I'll show you where that is because if the new owners are looking to do some alterations to the house, then the location of the stopcock might cause a bit of an issue. Um, not everybody wants to stop right in the middle of a kitchen and the kitchen for a family home is quite small so what this is kind of screaming out for is for this wall to come out have a lovely big kitchen dining room in here which might mean altering this 
If it's a case of just turning the units around to the wall, not a problem, because our stop clock is, is about there. It, it's literally out in the room, it's about 400 mil off that wall. So we could do something with that. Could be tidied up and altered, particularly if it's turned off in the front of the road. Uh, but these are the kind of things we, we need to think about. Um, both when we're doing our survey, but quite often we actually encourage our clients to give us a call. You know the property, you've looked at it a couple of times, you've now read our survey, give us a call, we'll go through any questions you've got and we'll see, um, see what perhaps we haven't answered in the report that you need answers for. Or if you want to do something, you change your mind, let us know and uh, we can run through it. So wrapping up the internal element of the inspection of this property, uh, we go around, open and close every door and window for, for one final time. Make sure they're all operational and where they're not, uh, we advise. Um, we then make sure the doors are closed that were here, that were closed when we got here. Any doors are open, we try and remember and leave those open. Um, but we leave the house as we found it. Um, we wouldn't ever want someone to come back to a property and know that we've been in there. Um, normally leave a business card with a little thank you on it if I know that people are perhaps out of work. Uh, but this, I believe, is going through probate, so um, perhaps we won't bother with that today. Um, this has been kind of a, seems like a bit of a whistle stop tour actually, but this video has been recorded over a single inspection of about three, three and a half hours of a mid terrace house. Hope you found it informative. As I said at the beginning, it's not going to be the same for everybody. Uh, some surveyors will do inside, bottom up, and then outside, top down, or, or bottom up, and then it really doesn't matter as long as you have your own methodology as to how you want to inspect a property and you keep it consistent. By keeping it consistent, you're less likely to make mistakes, which means you're less likely to get a claim made against us at some other point in life, um, some other point in time, sorry, which unfortunately is uh, is inevitable. I'm very pleased to say we've never had such a claim on a on a residential survey. And I think part of that is because we do everything in such a systematic manner. So this could be uh, a six bedroom detached house that we spend a day and a half, two, three days at doing a building survey. It'll be done in exactly the same way. Uh, outside or preliminaries first, outside, top down, inside, top down. Um, if we've got multiple roof spaces, we might do the whole of the roof as one collection first, um, but generally we wouldn't do, we do outside and then, then inside first, uh, second. Okay, hope you found it interesting. Uh, great thank you if you got this far. At the point of recording this, we're just shy of 100 subscribers and the channel's only been going a couple of months really. Um, so if you if you do like what we do and you'd like to see more of it, please, uh, please like and subscribe. Um, and by all means, give us a call, so give us an email or pop in the comments below what you want us to comment on further. We do a variety of building survey work, mainly fires, sorry, mainly insurance claims, fires, floods, and then we get involved in building defects and uh, we do building surveys such as this as well. So um, please give it the, the thumbs up and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.